White Island is New Zealand's most active volcano, with a long history of sudden and explosive eruptions. But despite its often violent and unpredictable nature, day trips to the island had become a major tourist attraction. However, many experts long warned it was a disaster waiting to happen. On December 9, 2019, despite showing escalating signs of unrest, and New Zealand's Volcano Monitoring Service raising the alert level to just one below an eruption, tours to the island continued. For the 47 people who found themselves trapped on the island when it suddenly erupted, there was no chance of escape. This is the story of the White Island eruption. Currently New Zealand's most active volcano, White Island sits around 48 kilometres off the mainland. Built by continuous volcanic activity over the past 150,000 years, the island spans an area of 325 hectares or 800 acres, with the above water section only around 30% of the total volcano. The island was named in 1769 by the British explorer and navigator Captain James Cook, the first European to set foot in New Zealand. Known as Tipuia Fakari to New Zealand's native Maori population, when translated into English, it means the dramatic volcano, a name that is definitely fitting. On September the 10th, 1914, disaster struck when a crater wall collapsed causing a cascade of boiling mud and rocks to engulf 10 miners, leaving only one survivor, the cat of one of the miners, found uninjured three weeks later. Sadly for the miners' families, however, the bodies of the men and their other cats were never found. Interestingly, according to the country's national library, the surviving tabby named Peter the Great went on to father numerous kittens. As already mentioned, White Island is New Zealand's most active volcano. For example, from 1975 to 2001, it was in a near constant state of minor eruption. In times of eruption, boiling hot steam, ash and rocks can engulf the island with little warning. For several decades, guided tours arriving by boat or helicopter took tens of thousands of tourists each year to the crater lake. Flanked by large cliffs, once at the crater lake, surrounded by vents, bubbling mud pits, and a lake of steaming hot acid, tour groups would be at the mercy of any sudden eruption. Ray Cass, a Monash University volcanologist in Melbourne who visited the island twice, likened the guided tours there to an accident waiting to happen. Basically, you have this hot cooker system at constant high temperature and high pressure, that could explode at any time. Although from 2001 through to the disaster in 2019, the island for the most part had been in a period of calm. However, eruptions in 2012, 2013 and 2016 should have served as a reminder of how dangerous the island could be. With the privilege of hindsight, the question is, why were tourists allowed on such a dangerous island? New Zealand has long prided itself as a place where tourists could dance with danger. It's the birthplace of bungee jumping and jet boating, among other activities. But is there a Shilby Wright approach to safety? In 2009, after at least 37 deaths in the adventure tourism industry in the four years prior, including a woman bungee jumping to her death when the operator forgot to attach the rope to the platform, then Prime Minister John Key ordered an industry-wide safety audit, but 10 years later, were things any better? For the small city of Whakatane in New Zealand's Bay of Plenty, day trips to White Island were the backbone of its tourism sector. Stopping the tours would have been a massive blow to the industry, and by extension, employment in the area. On the day of, and days prior to the eruption, 
New Zealand Volcano Monitoring Service GeoNet, raised the alert level on White Island to level 2, meaning heightened unrest. Level 3 is an eruption. However, the tours to the island didn't stop. When the New Zealand media questioned this, the chairman of White Island Tours had this to say. You routinely take people out on a level two day? Yes, yeah, in fact it's been a level two for about a week. In reality, White Island spent so much time at heightened alert levels, it appears a certain amount of risk had been normalised to keep business viable for the various operators. Was money put before safety? On December 9th, 2019, almost 100 people set out for White Island. Carrying mostly tourists from all parts of the world, the excursions were operated by White Island Tours or Volcanic Air, a 90-minute boat ride from Fokatane or a 40-minute flight from Rotorua. Although White Island Tours had advised on their website the island was at alert level 2, 38 passengers from a Royal Caribbean cruise ship parked in the nearby port of Tauranga who were joining the tour claimed they were not aware of the heightened activity. This footage shows an earlier tour walking to the crater lake around one hour prior to the eruption. Little were these guests or any others to the island that day likely aware but boiling hot mud and debris had been observed spewing 30 metres into the air on the far side of the crater lake over the week prior. A scientist from the monitoring service GeoNet had said six days earlier, while the activity is contained to the far side of the lake, the current level of activity does not pose a direct hazard to visitors. But in reality, the volcano had been acting in ways not seen since 2016 when it last erupted. As those lucky enough to be on an earlier tour departed the island, this picture captured at 10 minutes past 2 by a GeoNet monitoring camera shows a small group of tourists leaving the crater lake. Exactly one minute later, disaster struck. 47 people were still on the island. This tour boat was pulling away when the White Island volcano exploded to life with a massive plume of smoke and ash. American Michael Shade captured it all on his phone. He and his family had just finished their tour. It went from nothing going on to it erupting. We look back and we just saw this plume of smoke coming up from- The volcano had erupted at 11 minutes past two, showering those on the island in boiling hot steam, acidic sludge and poisonous gas, while a large plume of ash rose more than 12,000 feet into the sky. Although the departing boats initially attempted to outrun the ash, they would turn around to rescue badly injured survivors who had made it to the jetty. The devastation on the island was horrific. The prevailing wind had directed hot steam and ash towards those on the island. For many near the crater, death had been instant. Those who had survived had severe burns to most of their bodies. While survivors near the shore were rescued by the tour boats, those further inland were out of reach. 11 emergency service helicopters had been scrambled to nearby Fokatane in hopes of rescuing those still alive further up the mountain. However, authorities deemed landing on the island too dangerous and forbade any attempts to reach it. Regardless, seven commercial pilots who had seen the ash plume from the mainland ignored the order and went anyway. The most important thing was we went and cared for those folks who were alive, dying and dead. After reaching the island, they found 12 survivors near the crater lake, along with others who had perished. In varying states of consciousness, with charred black skin that fell off to the touch, they flew the survivors to Fokatane Hospital and gathered up the deceased, ready to be retrieved later. Good evening. There is no sign of life on Fakari White Island tonight after the eruption at our most active volcano and it's still too dangerous for recovery teams to go in. 
47 people were on the Bay of Plenty Island at the time. Five are confirmed dead, but eight are still missing on the island, with officials saying it'll now be a recovery operation. Over the days following the eruption, the death toll steadily rose as bodies were recovered from the island, and several of the most badly burned succumbed to their injuries. All but three survivors had suffered severe or critical injuries, and the vast majority had been burned. For many who had passed on the island, identification was only possible using dental records and DNA samples. Two days following the disaster, New Zealand ordered more than 186,000 square inches of skin from the United States and Australia to treat patients, some with burns to 95% of their bodies. On the 11th of December, two days following the disaster, the Royal Australian Air Force transported 13 Australians for treatment in Sydney and Melbourne, many of whom would eventually succumb to their injuries. Over the following weeks and months, the death toll kept growing. In July 2020, more than six months after the disaster, a German tourist finally lost his battle, becoming the last fatality, bringing the death toll to 22 of the 47 who were on the island. The New Zealand Police, in conjunction with WorkSafe New Zealand, launched an investigation into the disaster. Ten organisations, including White Island Tours and Volcanic Air, were charged under the Health and Safety at Work Act for failing to ensure the health and safety of its workers and others, charges carrying a maximum fine of $1.5 million. On the 26th of August 2021, nine of the defendants pleaded not guilty, while charges were dropped against GNS Science and the National Emergency Management Agency. The rest will face trial in July of 2023. Although civil lawsuits for damage or negligence are generally not possible within New Zealand, American couple Lauren Barham Yuri and Matthew Yuri, plus the families of other victims, filed a lawsuit against Royal Caribbean, ID Tours and White Island Tours within the United States, claiming that the defendants had ample warning that the volcano was on the brink of eruption, but failed to warn passengers. Had I known what I know now, there is a 0% chance we would have ever set foot on that island. In October 2022, the seven helicopter pilots, who ignored an order not to fly to the island and rescued 12 people from the Crater Lake, were given New Zealand Bravery Awards for their efforts. The eruption on White Island that day lasted just two minutes, but for those lucky enough to have survived, the recovery from their injuries will take decades but the trauma and nightmares will last a lifetime. Let me know your thoughts on this disaster. Was it a tragedy waiting to happen? A calculated risk for adventure? Or should there never have been tours to the island? And as always, thanks for watching.